Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. And I'm Adrian Arsenault. Tonight, new reason to doubt Iran's explanation for the downing of Flight 752. We are examining uh, every bit of evidence uh, that, or potential evidence that becomes available. CBC News investigates an audio recording of a voice identified as Iran's foreign minister. Also tonight, a COVID outbreak in St. John's puts hundreds in isolation. Voting as much as it is a privilege and is a right and something that personally I've taken serious. Will it cost them the chance to vote? Our case is based on cold, hard facts. It's all about the facts. Principle, politics, and partisanship, an impeachment trial begins. And surgical training with a pandemic twist. I was amazed at how realistic it was. Canadian technology sews up a teaching gap. This is The National. CBC News has heard a recording of a man sources identify as Iran's foreign minister. And in that recording, the man acknowledges the downing of Flight 752 could have been intentional. The takeaway from this top Iranian official is that when it comes to the truth about one of the worst air disasters in Canadian history, we may never know the real story. Last January, the Ukraine International Airlines plane crashed near Tehran shortly after takeoff. All aboard killed, including 138 people with ties to Canada. Publicly, Iran's foreign minister pushed his government's line that the plane was shot down by accident. His apparent stance in private? Maybe, maybe not. Now, we are protecting the identity of the source out of concern for their safety. Ashley Burke and her team had several people translate the recording from Farsi to account for any nuances in the language. Here's an exclusive look at what it reveals. For 13 months, the question has been, could this have been intentional? A voice that sources identified as Iran's Minister of Foreign Affairs says on a secret recording it is possible. Yeah, totally possible. Mohammad Javad Zarif says Iran's military wing, the Revolutionary Guard, which shot the plane down, could have been infiltrated, for example. He's heard saying privately, even if you assume that it was an organized, intentional act, they would never tell us or anyone else. There would have been two or three people who did this, and it's not at all unlikely. They could have been infiltrators. There are a thousand possibilities. Then goes on to say Iran's highest levels of the government and military would never reveal the truth. They won't tell us nor anyone else because if they do, it will open some doors into the defense systems of the country that will not be in the interest of the nation to publicly say. Some call the recording a significant new piece of evidence. It's not clear why he would have said that it is not at all unlikely that it was intentional. But the fact that he sees that as a real possibility, um, I think, should, should make us pause and, and really consider whether there's not something uh, far more uh, diabolical at play. For months, Canadian authorities have been analyzing the recording's authenticity, but say the content's too sensitive, the risk too high to reveal much more. We are examining uh, every bit of evidence uh, that or potential evidence that becomes available with uh, with great seriousness to make sure that we're not missing anything. I think it's another reason for us uh, not to accept anything smaller than the truth. Ukraine's ambassador to Canada says his country was unaware of the audio, despite the RCMP helping with its criminal investigation. If verified, he says the recording could help their case. We do not want to see the truth being hidden behind state secrecy. We want to get to the bottom of this. Okay, Ashley, so what other details were on this recording? Well, there were several references to compensating families as a way to close this case and avoid countries pursuing this as an international crime. Late last year, Iran said it was setting aside $150,000 for each victim's family, an offer that Canadian families flatly rejected. Right, and, and there's still an ongoing safety investigation into the downing of Flight 752. Where does that stand? Well, Ukraine is one of the countries that has a draft of Iran's final report. It has until the end of the month to provide feedback. But the ambassador already told me that people need to manage their expectations. The report will say that a missile hit the plane, but not what people want to know. Who hit the button and why? Ashley Burke, thanks very much.
A little more than a year since his first impeachment, Donald Trump is now on trial again in the U.S. Senate. So it may feel like deja vu, but lots has changed inside. Senators in masks, hearing a case against a now former president, and outside, National Guard soldiers in razor wire fences, a sign that no chances are being taken on security in the wake of the violence that led to Trump's unprecedented second impeachment. Joining us now is senior correspondent Susan Ormiston. So, Susan, uh, quite the scene in D.C. Yeah, another history-making moment here on Capitol Hill, Adrian. The first impeachment trial of a former U.S. president feeding right into a divided America. Is this a just punishment for inciting an insurrection, or is this a partisan feeding frenzy meant to prevent Trump from ever running again? A reckoning in somber procession, the Democrats' prosecution team determined to punish Trump for good. Our case is based on cold, hard facts. And then they rolled the facts. A searing 13-minute movie, the worst of a horrible day. Graphic scenes interlaced with Trump's own words in a damning timeline. We're going to walk down Pennsylvania Avenue and we're going to the Capitol. We're going to try and give them the kind of pride and boldness that they need to take back our country. Defend your Constitution! Defend your liberty! Reminding the senators, now jurists, of the rioting mob who threatened them and glorified Trump. Fight for Trump! Fight for Trump! People died that day. Officers ended up with head damage and brain damage. People's eyes were gouged. Presidents can't inflame insurrection in their final weeks and then walk away like nothing happened. Then on to Act One in Trump's defense. Free speech is protected and impeachment a long-held tactic by Democrats. I would vote yes. I would vote, I would vote to impeach. Because we're gonna go in there, we're gonna impeach the mother His lawyers argued citizen Trump has already been removed from office. A great many Americans see this process for exactly what it is, a chance by a group of partisan politicians seeking to eliminate Donald Trump from the American political scene. January 6th is seared in American psyche and the consequences still so evident around Capitol Hill, guarded and barricaded. Ms. Baldwin, As the aye. first vote Mr. Blumenthal, aye. Mr. Blumenthal, decided that this Mr. trial Blumenthal. is constitutional no. and will Mr. carry Blumenthal, on aye. tomorrow. And so, Susan, it will carry on without him. Trump is not there. What, what's being reported about his reactions? Well, some blowback from Trump and his Florida estate, extremely unhappy with his legal team's performance. The lead lawyer, Bruce Castor, rambling on at points, not pressing his points, and even complimenting the Democrats on their presentation. Of course, this was the team he hired a week ago after he fired his first legal team. And, of course, obviously, really unlikely this will end with a conviction. Yeah, exceedingly slim. I mean, the Democrats have to get 17 Republicans to vote with them. Little sign of that. But conviction isn't the only goal here. The Democrats want to divide Republican support and remind Americans over and over again just how Donald Trump exited from power. All right. Thank you, Susan. Senior correspondent Susan Ormiston in Washington. So if Trump isn't convicted, what does accountability actually look like? We will get to that and more of what you can expect in the days to come in about 20 minutes. Turning back to Canada and the fight against COVID-19. Ottawa has announced new measures for non-essential travellers entering the country. As of February 15th, when you return to Canada through a land border, you'll need to show a 72-hour PCR test, just like for air travel. Now, Canadians can't be denied entry at the border, but if you show up without proof of a negative COVID test, you could face a fine of up to $3,000. All the travel restrictions have led to even more cuts at Air Canada. Starting next week, 17 international routes will be put on hold and more than 1,500 jobs will be cut, including managers. The airline says this is a direct result of new travel restrictions and a big drop in demand for flying. There was some relief today for self-employed Canadians caught up in the confusion of pandemic benefits. As Catherine Cullen tells us, people who got the CERB because the rules weren't clear 
do not have to pay the money back. It's a good day for Alison Griffiths. After months of anxiety, she thought this moment might never come. I'm absolutely thrilled. There are so many struggling self-employed individuals out there who now have just this huge load off their chest. She was one of 441,000 Canadians who got a letter from the CRA late last year saying she might have to repay her Canada Emergency Response Benefit. In my new book, Griffiths wrote a book on personal finance, so she was pretty surprised to hear the problem came down to how self-employment income was defined. Gross income or net? When I got the letter, I, I thought that there was a mistake, actually. And it wasn't just her, her husband, her adult daughter, on the hook for $14,000 each, she says. The situation got messier later in December. The union representing CRA employees said workers had been given the wrong information about self-employment income and shared it with callers for about three weeks. At the beginning, when people were phoning, uh, unfortunately, there was a, a mistake made. Today, the Prime Minister said those caught up by the definition of self-employment income are off the hook. As long as you meet the other eligibility criteria, you will not have to return those CERB payments. Anyone who is already repaid will get their money back as soon as possible, officials say. I confess I would like to have heard we made a mistake and we've decided to fix it, but, you know, maybe that's asking for too much. She calls it a backtrack by the government. One minister said it's a course correction. We are dealing here um, with a subset of the 9 million Canadians who applied for CERB who legitimately and honestly relied on misinformation we provided. And that's the problem we're solving here today. The cost and the number of people affected is something the government says it's still sorting out. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. Ottawa is being asked to help small businesses with another kind of payment, the ones they have to make to credit card companies for online transactions. Diane Buckner explains why they say the help is so badly needed. The pandemic turned business at this Vancouver Island brew pub upside down. Suddenly, sales had to be made online. That's costing us more to make less, um, is the simplest way to put it. Like all merchants who accept Visa and MasterCard, Isaiah Archer has to pay a transaction fee that's split between his bank, the payment processor, and the credit card company. And he says the fee for online sales is higher than in-store sales. I think those, those credit card companies, they're um, probably doing better than they ever have because um, a lot of consumers are going online. Both credit card companies actually lowered their rates last year as part of a 2018 agreement with Ottawa from an average of 1.5% to 1.4. In our business, we count pennies. You know, it's a very small margin business. But this supermarket owner says he pays significantly more than that for online and phone orders, over 2%. We have to pass pricing on to customers in order to keep whatever net profit we need to sustain. In a statement to CBC News, Visa said its rates for e-commerce transactions are lower than they've ever been. MasterCard says it's committed to meeting its voluntary agreement with the Government of Canada to reach the fee target. But critics note the fee target for both credit card companies is an average that includes every type of business. Huge corporations can often negotiate a lower rate. Big companies, of course, can bring uh, millions, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of business to these payment processors and can threaten to take it away. Back at the brewery, Archer says these days any sale beats no sale, even with higher fees. So we'll take it, right? But um, it's not a lot of choice uh, as a small business. He hopes pressure from small business associations will lead to urgent action from Ottawa. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Sharon, Ontario. Well, COVID-19 cases continue to fall in most parts of the country, but not in Newfoundland and Labrador, where a COVID surge could have a big impact on the provincial election. The province reported 30 new cases today. That's its highest daily number since last April. Health officials are moving rapidly to try to contain the spike. They are bringing in new restrictions for the St. John's area as of midnight tonight, limiting how many people can gather, closing gyms, bars, and movie theaters. And with voters going to the polls this weekend, some say the timing could not be worse. Hundreds of people are in quarantine right now and could lose their shot at voting. Kayla Hounsel spoke with one of them. 
I've been in self-isolation now for about 24 hours. Gary Dawson's entire family is in a two-week isolation because of a positive case of COVID-19 at the after-school program his twin boys attend. It means he can't vote in this weekend's provincial election. It's upsetting, um, you know, voting as much as it is a privilege, it is a right, uh, and it's something that personally I've taken serious. It is not yet clear how the latest outbreak began, but multiple cases have been linked to a high school in the St. John's area. And with up to 1,500 people now in isolation, some are questioning the timing of the election. Well, there's no great time to have an election. I mean, that's the bottom line. And um, this was always going to be a COVID-19 election. There was nothing I could do about that. Uh, and uh, that's the law. Premier Andrew Fury was required by law to call an election before August, one year since he was sworn in as Premier. Anyone who hasn't already voted by mail or in advance polls now has to vote in person. Going to a grocery store, which is an essential uh, element uh, of life, is about the same risk profile as going uh, to vote. But the progressive conservative leader is accusing Fury of playing politics with public health and says the Liberal leader shouldn't even be a part of COVID briefings. It's giving them a stage now in which to strut their stuff within days of an election vote taking place. It's politically inappropriate. Dawson says there is so much anxiety in the community, he worries even those who can vote this Saturday won't. I look at demographics like seniors and folks that might be in long-term care facilities, you know, that generally do go out and vote in elections. He says that alone is cause for change and the election should be postponed. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Health Canada is changing the way it measures doses in vials of the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID vaccine, increasing it from five. It was determined that six full doses could be obtained reliably and consistently from each vaccine vial. Notably, though, Alberta disagrees, saying even with the right tools and training, they can only get that sixth dose about 75% of the time. It matters because Canada has ordered doses, not vials. So if provinces can't actually extract all the doses, they'll come up short. Either way, Canada is expecting a big uptick in Pfizer shipments next week. Now, doses are being delivered in Manitoba in the larger centres and on First Nations. In both cases, the effort is driven with an eye to reconciliation. Cameron McIntosh has the details. This isn't happening anywhere else. In a Winnipeg industrial park, a pop-up vaccine clinic. First Nations run for First Nations people. Like elder Geraldine Shingus. I wasn't open to the vaccine and the trust. I had trusting. She was convinced by her family. The reason why I'm, I'm doing the vaccine is because... Um, it's really critical that uh, my knowledge is protected. Mistrust of and mishandling within government health care systems runs deep for many Indigenous people. Manitoba is turning to reconciliation. Okay. Giving responsibility for First Nations vaccine distribution to Indigenous leaders and medical professionals. This is important for First Nations people. This is important for all Manitobans. You don't have allergies? First, that means building trust in the vaccine making sure elders and spiritual leaders get it first. This is medicine. We don't see it as a scientific entity. We see it as, as a medicine for our people. Then it's getting it into arms. In Manitoba's north, where the military is still dealing with outbreaks, vaccines are arriving. This clinic will focus on urban people, about one half of Manitoba's Indigenous population, many transient and disadvantaged. I think that there's a, a series of interconnectedness in the city where we need to advocate to ensure that no one slips through the cracks. Populations knowledge keeper Cheryl Lynn Blacksmith says are often ignored. For this country and the history that we have with this country, that's amazing that they've done that. It's, it's so important as a whole uh, Canadian society. We need to beat this thing and we need to beat it together. Reconciled to beat the virus and build trust. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. In Quebec, an inquiry has been launched into the wrongful arrest of Mamadi Kamara, who was charged with trying to kill a Montreal police officer last month. We don't have enough information to know if it's a case of racism. Kamara spent six nights in jail before being completely exonerated last week. 
The police chief apologized, insisting the arrest was based on evidence, not racial profiling. Kamar's lawyer says they are happy about the inquiry, but still have questions about how it will work. The Ontario driver who killed four people in a 2015 crash has been granted full parole. Marco Muzzo was returning from a bachelor party when he sped through a stop sign and smashed into a minivan. Nine-year-old Daniel Neville Lake and his younger siblings Harrison and Millie died along with their grandfather. Today, the children's mother posted a picture of their graves saying, nothing changed for me. A warning tonight for Canadians in Hong Kong. These are developments that we find very concerning. Next on The National, why some dual passport holders are being pressured to renounce their Canadian citizenship. Training for surgery with video game technology. The Canadian invention giving hands-on experience, even in a pandemic. Is it fun? It's a blast. It, re it really is fun, yeah. And a Texas lawyer suffers, well, technical difficulties. Well, I think it's a filter. It, and it is, and I don't know how to remove it. The cat and the court. We're back in two. Increasingly violent clashes between protesters and police continued in Myanmar today. Water cannons, tear gas, and rubber bullets have been used against demonstrators as police crack down on thousands, defying a curfew and protest ban. There are also reports of live rounds being fired. Protesters are standing against a military coup that removed the elected government last week. Hong Kong media tycoon Jimmy Lai has been denied bail as he awaits trial under a controversial new national security law. Lai is accused of fraud and colluding with foreign forces. The 73-year-old is a fierce critic of Beijing and is the most high-profile person charged under the law. He has been in custody since December of last year. Well, the Canadian government is warning dual citizens in Hong Kong about a new hard line from Chinese officials. There has been pressure on some detainees to give up their Canadian citizenship, and the implications could be far-reaching. Here's Tanya Fletcher. Hong Kong passport, this is my Canadian passport. Uh, a proud dual citizen, Kevin Chong, is unnerved by the idea of being forced to choose one nationality over the other. But open that Canadian passport to the back inside cover and you'll find this long-standing disclaimer to dual citizens. Be aware that your Canadian citizenship may not be recognized by the country of your other nationality, it says, which could jeopardize the right to consular protection from Canada. And that's exactly what happened last month to a Canadian dual citizen serving a prison sentence in Hong Kong. And there have been more cases since, says Canada's Consul General in Hong Kong. This is a new practice that's being applied here. So these are things, uh, developments that we find very concerning. China doesn't recognize dual citizens and technically neither does Hong Kong. The law has been on the books in the region since 1997 but hasn't been enforced until now. And it's not just Canadians, others are being targeted too. And we are now working with those other countries uh, to raise these issues at the highest levels with the Hong Kong government and, and with the central government of China. Ask why now, and many observers will take you back to these moments, the pro-democracy protests seen by many as a direct threat to Beijing. It's concerning because we know that Hong Kong has changed. You can see that um, the government is becoming less and less tolerant to dissent. So far, only dual citizens who've been detained have been forced to choose a primary nationality. But Xin doesn't think it will stop there. He believes the uncertainty alone could prompt a new wave of migration to Canada. Well, most people are talking about it. Um, Quietly, but Edward Chin is a dual citizen who returned to Hong Kong more than 20 years ago. He says a gradual anxiety has been rising there. And if given an ultimatum... I would choose freedoms, definitely. Freedoms and democracy. Who wants to live in a place where there's no freedoms? The choice for him, an easy one, but to a decision he hopes he never has to make. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. Next, we return to history unfolding in the U.S. tonight. We cannot have presidents inciting and mobilizing mob violence against our government. Donald Trump's second impeachment trial will proceed, but with little chance of conviction, is there a cost to pushing for one? 
on the northeast tip of North America on an island called Newfoundland. And Come From Away makes a comeback in Australia. We speak to the cast about returning to the stage for the first time since the pandemic. But first. Today, Texas District Attorney Rod Ponton appeared in virtual court with a little problem. I believe you have a filter turned on. No filter can hide this moment of panic. Uh, hey, we're trying to, we're tr can you hear me, Judge? I can hear you. I think it's a filter. It, in the it is, and I don't know how to remove it. I've got my assistant here. She's trying to, but uh, I'm prepared to go forward with it. That's, I'm here live. That's not, I'm not a cat. What is striking is that aside from a friendly smile, everyone plays it straight. I can see that. And that was the point the judge wanted to make when he posted the moment online. This gentleman handled it uh, very gracefully. Uh, it would have been different if I had laughed. Meanwhile, Ponton, who actually looks like this, said he was happy the moment delivered some laughs outside of court. In the wake of the absurd, frightening, and ultimately deadly assault on the U.S. Capitol, Democrats are looking for punishment that acknowledges what Donald Trump said led to what they did. We fight like hell, and if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. We will prove with overwhelming evidence that President Trump is singularly and directly responsible for inciting the assault on the Capitol. But what Democrats seem to want to happen probably won't. In the history of the U.S., only four times has a president faced a Senate impeachment trial. Two of those trials were about Donald Trump. He was acquitted just a little over a year ago, and now he's expected to be acquitted again. There just isn't the math for a two-thirds majority needed to convict. Besides, he is, of course, now a former president. So what is the point? Will battling for the principle pay off or simply turn Trump into a political martyr emboldened by it all? And so to cut through the bombast and the process of the start of Trump's second Senate impeachment trial, let's bring in Kelly Jane Torrance, a conservative and a Canadian who sits on the editorial board of the New York Post, and Krish Omara Vignaraja, a former Obama administration official. So thank you for joining us both tonight. Uh, we, we always need your insights. And Kelly Jane, let's start with you, because it seems pretty clear there will not be the math, the two-thirds majority math to convict Trump. So what are Republicans saying about what the effects of this process will be on him? Yeah, it's a great question, Adrian. because, uh, yeah, it's clear. It was, we saw today um, only six Republicans voted with Democrats to agree that it was constitutional to impeach our former president. So uh, Democrats have, would have a lot of work. They would have to uh, have at least 11 Republican senators think that it's unconstitutional, but vote for impeachment anyway. So it's not going to happen. And I think that, you know, people are wondering what if this was a wise move. Are there not some Republicans, though, who are saying, you know, he, he may not be convicted, but this might be the end of his political career? I think most Republicans, uh, you know, maybe not most, but a lot of Republicans, especially uh, those in Congress, thought that Donald Trump's political career ended, really, on January 6th. Most people think, uh, even Republicans, that Donald Trump created the conditions for that kind of disaster to happen with his talk for over a month of a supposed stolen election. And uh, given what happened January 6th, I think that a lot of Republicans see his career as over. Okay, so Chris, so if at the end of the day this does, you know, mark the end of Trump's personal political career, in a way has that not accomplished what Democrats were ultimately looking for? I don't think so. Um, I really don't think that this is about politics. Um, you know, when President Trump left office, he left with the lowest approval ratings of any president. Um, and I agree with the statement that on January 6th, um, he left, lo lost any prospect of uh, getting elected to political office again. Um, but this isn't about politics. This is about accountability. This is about inciting a mob that intended to take over Congress, endangering the lives of political leaders. And so until there is accountability, I don't think that this is over. 
this is a, a process about Donald Trump, but without him. You know, he won't testify. He's banned from his beloved social media platforms. Kelly, what is the effect of that on him and, and his base? Yeah, Adrienne, it's, you know, we've hardly heard from Donald Trump because he is used to talking to people directly, uh, the American people, through Facebook and Twitter, which have banned him. Uh, the only thing I've seen come out from Donald Trump recently, of course, was his letter um, resigning from the Screen Actors Guild, which was sort of classic uh, Trump in, in its hilarity. But we're really not seeing much of him. And without that voice, uh, I think he really goes into the wilderness. And in fact, if Democrats weren't impeaching him right now or weren't putting him on trial, uh, we would be talking a lot more, I think, about what President Biden wants to do about this terrible economy, about the pandemic that's still going on. It's interesting to me that, uh, you know, Donald Trump, I really think, would, would start to become a memory, if not for this impeachment trial. So we want to play a, a clip here of one of Trump's lawyers, uh, Bruce Castor. Have a listen, and then we'll have a chat. They're smart enough to pick a new administration if they don't like the old one. And they just did. And he's down there, Pennsylvania Avenue now, probably wondering, how come none of my stuff is happening up at the Capitol? So, Chris, I, I suppose on the face of it, for some people, he, he's not wrong. How does that argument sit with you? Yeah, I mean, this idea that the election results were enough, I think, is insufficient because the election results weren't enough, right? They were not enough to stop him. Um, the decisive victory in the necessary states was not enough to stop him from the incendiary language he used. And so this is where, when we are talking about seven dead, 150 injured, political leaders cowering in corners because they believe that their lives were in danger, there has to be accountability. And so this is where I think that this argument that the election results were sufficient, it, it doesn't actually reflect the reality of what we're talking about. And Kelly Jane, if we can talk about the Republican Party for a moment here, what kind of spot are Republican senators in right now? And I'm curious about the pressures on them, especially the young ones who have, you know, hopes to have long political careers. Well, that's an interesting question, because in some ways, uh, especially if they're very ambitious and they're interested in a presidential run in 2024, you might think that they would have the incentive to actually bar Trump from being able to run for that office. But I think they know that most Americans, uh, most Republicans, uh, don't think that this impeachment is uh, is anything more than politics. So, uh, you know, there's a, you could notice that most of the uh, Republicans who voted that this is constitutional today, they are those moderates who often uh, break from their party on certain votes, like Susan Collins of Maine and Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, or people who aren't running again, like Pat Toomey in Pennsylvania. Uh, those that are still running, Trump is still something of a force in the party. Uh, most Republicans, uh, your average voter, uh, supports Trump. Uh, he actually got more Republican votes in 2020 than he did in 2016. I think that signals that there is a divide and it's not going to be an easy one. It's not obviously the Trump faction is winning, mm -hmm. the anti-Trump faction is winning. Okay, Chris, last word to you. What, what worries you right now about how all of this is being handled? Yeah, I mean, we've not seen a siege on our capital um, since 1814. Um, you know, this is not something that is supposed to happen in the Western Hemisphere. And yet we saw this happen on January 6th. And the fact that we see more accountability by private individuals like Jack Dorsey and Mark Zuckerberg than we have seen from our political leaders is disconcerting. This is not a conventional situation, right? We've never had a president of the United States incite a mob to take siege of the Capitol. And so this is where I hope um, in the next couple of days, we will see senators um, who listen intently. But these are senators who were not just uh, jurors in the conventional sense, they are witnesses, they are victims. And so I think it'll be interesting to see what we see as the questions they ask following those arguments made um, by both sides. All right. Thank you, Krisha Mara Vignaraja, Kelly Jane Torrance, as always. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next. Training for surgery without ever stepping into the OR. I was amazed at how realistic it was. Why med schools are turning to Canadian VR innovators right after the break. But first, a preview of a story we'll have for you here tomorrow night on The National. Oh, my God. This one is brutal. Dr. Freud, this is impossible. By chance, are you having a hard time recognizing people in masks? 
It's not you. Really, it's not just you. It's all of us. Start memorizing the different faces. Okay. Cognitive neuroscientist Erez Freud has been watching how we all watch others, testing to see if our brains are adapting, rewiring themselves during this pandemic. He's learning a lot, and so are other researchers, and apparently we may get confused, but we seem to like who and what we see. When we are wearing a mask, other people find us as being more attractive. Here's looking at you tomorrow on The National. Welcome back. This past year, so many students have had to adapt to virtual learning. And that's maybe especially true for students of surgery. Because the solution in med school can be far more high-tech than just a plain old Zoom call. David Common looks at how the University of Toronto is using virtual reality to train future surgeons. Now, the things that I'm feeling for and listening for are the cortical chatter of the reamer on the inner part of the femur. No question, this is all a bit weird. The fusing of medicine and video games with faceless surgeons, their hands floating around a virtual patient. And I'm going to line those up with the femur. Orthopedic surgeon Danny Goyle is the medical mind behind the Made in Canada invention called Precision OS. I think the middle size is probably the correct one. The virtual reality program is exploding in popularity, due in part to the restrictions of the pandemic. And so if, if I'm happy there, I can pin this in place. We learn a lot when we're in the operating room. And now that patients are not having surgery, learning has essentially ceased for a lot of the learners and surgeons around the world. There are now fewer surgeries. With hospital resources stretched and redirected, surgical skills can, as a result, go stale. More than anything, it's been a loss for medical students. A problem that U of T Med School orthopedic surgery professor Peter Ferguson was facing head on, worried about his medical residence. And then along came a set of VR goggles. Is it fun? It's a, it's a blast. It, re it really is fun, yeah. I, in fact, fixed somebody's, uh, a virtual patient's broken leg in my own living room, putting a metal pin in. And my wife said I looked sort of ridiculous doing it, but I was, I was amazed at how realistic it was. And so at, at that point in time, I, I went to our faculty and I said, you know, this is something that we really have to get on board with. His medical school bought a dozen of them, farmed them out to keep students learning. And it's all no stakes, like they're not going to hurt a real patient. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That, that, that's a, a definite advantage. Uh, if we can decrease that incidence of complications by allowing uh, these individuals to become more competent in this low stakes environment, it will, uh, you know, theoretically improve patient outcomes. I guess I've just inserted the nail into a femur and you can take an x-ray to see your positioning, your angle, and then you can Dr. Megan Shields is a third year surgical resident and is still new to practicing using Precision OS, along with students from 22 other medical schools across North America. Grabbing the uh, guide wire. What do you make of it so far? Um, like it's it's a pretty impressive technology. Like I think it has a lot of potential to to aid in learning. Impressive, but not surprising. Coming from Vancouver's now firmly entrenched video game development scene. Vancouver has really sort of led the charge on game development, film and computer graphics. And I think that marriage between medicine and technology is unique to our city here. Just did a knee replacement. A product of Vancouver scaled up in a pandemic and setting trends along the way. David Common, CBC News, Toronto. Amazing. Next, remembering a Motown legend, but first. That first audience was, it was like equal parts surreal and normal at the same time. An emotional comeback as the cast of Come From Away returns to the stage in Australia. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, workers at one Amazon warehouse in Alabama are voting on whether to unionize, and this one vote could have ripple effects across the company and beyond. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. The musical Come From Away, already a Canadian success story, is now a pandemic comeback story. 
Ten months after COVID-19 shut down theaters, live performances have resumed in lucky Australia. Eli Glasner has the details. I'm the northeast tip of North America on an island called Newfoundland. In Melbourne, the theater is practically packed for a show about the Canadian community that pulled together after the events of 9-11. Oh, welcome to the rock if you come from away. You probably understand about a half of what we see. The Australian production of Come From Away closed its doors nearly a year ago. With new cases in Melbourne now down to single digits, Come From Away has been one of the first shows back, with mandatory contact tracing and masking. But when the curtain was raised again... That first audience was... It was like equal parts surreal and normal at the same time. Musical director Luke Hunter endured months of strict lockdowns. When he heard the audience roar, he realized what he'd missed. It surprised me. I, I'd, I'd forgotten how impactful it is to hear that, the, the sound of a group of people that have been through an experience together. When the pandemic halted the production, this actor returned home to Chicago, where COVID took its toll. A couple aunts had it, um, lost a, a, a matriarch to the family. Now she channels that experience into her performance. There's a very different energy amongst us on stage and amongst the audience that, you know, a, a shared, we've been through something and um, we need each other. For the fans, come from away is a symbol. The show being uplifting, but having that of, yes, I'm able to return to this sense of normality. It does, it warms the soul. Fish and chips and but it's also a beacon for the other productions in Toronto. You are carving this path back to the world. On Broadway. Our hearts are so full. In London and beyond. Wishing you the best, best opening night. All still waiting in the wings to share this Canadian story with the world. Eli Glasper, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, the moment is next, but first, a moment to remember a Motown legend. Mary Wilson, a founding member of the Supremes, has passed away. In 1961, they were three teens from the projects when they signed with the Detroit label. But as the Supremes, Diana Ross, Florence Ballard, and Mary Wilson were all sequins and sleek moves, they became one of the most commercially successful groups of the decade with a string of hits. The original trio broke up unhappily in the late 60s, but Mary Wilson carried on with replacement singers. I don't want to ever lose that identity. I like the identity of the Supreme. She also pursued a solo career and just this week announced plans to release new songs. Mary Wilson died at her home in Nevada. She was 76 years old. Junior Niamusa has been keeping pretty busy for the last four years, writing and publishing his first novel, and he's just 14 years old. His book just released, and the young author hopes to inspire other kids to write. Tonight, he's our moment. I wrote Survival of the Fittest. I've been writing it for four years, since I was 10 years old, and I just completed it. It's definitely exhilarating to finally have completed this after such a long time working on it. It wasn't to be published at first, but then like halfway through, I showed it to my parents and they thought that I should keep on writing it because maybe I could get it published. They thought it was pretty good. And now here we are. And we are both giving 5% of our cut of the sales to Tabitha's Daughters International. They supply feminine hygiene products to girls in Africa and the publisher decided to match my donation. I just feel like I could be an inspiration to other black youth to show them that yes, you can do it. I hope that it can also help to inspire them to show them that as long as you put in the work and uh, give it your all, then you can achieve almost anything you set your sights on. So what is this book about? Well, Junior <laughs> told our producer, Liza, it's about a 13 year old. Uh, 
He said that this 13 year old has a disease called Manchester's disease and there's an organization after him and his mom and they're trying to get away but he also has superpowers and I'm not saying anything more. It's, yeah, you don't want to spoil <laughs> nope. the end. It sounds like quite the adventure and, and just imagine writing this over a four year period, right? Like how much your writing would Finishing change. Finishing it is amazing. Yeah, no, it's great. And, and he got to do a, a reading recently at a library in London, Ontario nice. for, for Black History Month. So, so good stuff, good stuff. That's The National for this February 9th. Have a good night. Good night.